He is kind. Life is not, at least not always. I pray that, that, that you know just how kind our God is. In fact, as we, we kick off this series, he gets us, for those of you joining us uh, on each one of our campuses, for those of you joining us online, our, our prayer really for you is this, is that, I, is that I know that many of you that are joining us today, you want to believe that God is kind. I mean, you really, you really hope that it's true, but you're not sure. It's not always been your experience. And our prayer for you over the course of these next several weeks while we're in the midst of this series is that you would not only know about the kindness of God, but that you would start to, maybe for the first time in your life, you would start to experience it. You would start to feel. You would know in an intimate, in a deep way, just how much God loves you, just how good he is, and just how kind he is. Three weeks ago today, I got a call from my dad and mom. Uh, my, my brother, my older brother, died unexpectedly. I know some of you have gotten a call just this week, very similar to that. Or just recently in this season that you're in. You know, one of the things that I love that Natalie shared in her video today is, is she said is she was going through that season of great uncertainty. When you don't have all the answers, when life doesn't make sense, life is definitely not what you want it to be. It's, it's gone off script. Is even in those moments, what Natalie, she says, she says, I knew that I wasn't alone. She knew Jesus is, is a God who will not leave us or forsake us. She knows that, that he's with us. But one of the things I believe that makes Jesus so kind is not just that he's with us. I mean, that's amazing in and of itself, but it's not just that he's with us. It's that Jesus gets us. He's not only with us, he gets us. He understands us. He's been through everything that we've been through. You know, one of the, one of the core beliefs that we have in our faith that, that I don't know if we really talk about much or think about much, but, but here's what we believe about who Jesus was, is that during Jesus' life, while he was on earth, we believe that Jesus was 100% God. We also believe that he was 100% man. Now, I don't know how that worked. I don't completely understand it myself. There's so much about God that we will never fully understand or fully comprehend, and that's okay. That's why he's divine and we're simply man, right? He needs to be above us. We actually want him to be above us. We don't want to fully understand or know God if he's truly all-powerful. But one of the things I think as we think about Jesus, we often probably, if you're like me, we think about all of the ways Jesus was different than us. All the ways he was like God, the fact that he was without sin, he was perfect. We think about like his great power and the miracles that he did. One of the things that maybe we don't think often enough is how Jesus was like us. Because the fact that he was 100% man means that he experienced 100% of the things that you and I go through every day, the good and the not so good, the tragic. The trials. In fact, Hebrews chapter four, verse four, 14 through 15. This is a verse we're gonna talk about a lot throughout this series. I love this. This is the message version of that. Um, this is what it says about the, the humanness of Jesus. It says, now that we know that we have Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's, net it, let's not let it slip through our fingers. Like, don't miss this. That's what it's saying. Don't miss this truth. We don't have a priest, Jesus, who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing. He's experienced it all. Every hard thing that you've ever been through, Jesus knows. He gets you. He gets us. In fact, as, as, we, as we think about this idea of, of Jesus getting us, um, one of the things that, the, one of the ways that he gets us is anytime we experience confusion in our lives, when life goes 
off script. We're going to talk about a lot of the ways in the weeks ahead about, about the, 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 the ways that Jesus is able to relate to us. Today, where we're going to land on is confusion. Now, not to be confused about confusion, Here, here's how I would define confusion for us today, is that Jesus wrestled through confusion, which, which confusion for me, I think this is a great definition, is confusion is a lack of coherent or orderly thinking. Anytime we just kind of have that fog in our heads, when things don't make sense, we're not quite sure about where we stand, what's happening around us, like what we're supposed to do. It's a lack of coherent and orderly thinking and feeling. In the midst of complex problems, anybody have any problems going on in their life? Relationships? Any tough relational challenges right now in your life? Or any decision-making opportunities? We can experience confusion in any one of those three things, either really challenging trials in difficult relationships, or just when we're trying to make a decision. It may not even be a bad thing. We're just trying to do the right thing, the thing that God wants us to do. Now, as we, as we think about Jesus himself wrestling with confusion, I don't know if, if this hits any of the rest of you, but for me, this feels, it feels a little irreverent to actually have this thought that Jesus experienced confusion in his life. Again, my natural thought is he was above that. He, didn't, he doesn't really get it. But when we read scripture, the account of Jesus' life, I think it's very clear that Jesus not only wrestled with it, I think confusion tormented him throughout his ministry. And there's no place that we see that better than in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're gonna get to that in a few seconds, but, but here's kind of the big idea before we jump into the confusion Jesus experienced. What we so desperately want in our lives, what we crave is certainty. Right? We want certainty. We desire security. And a lot of times when, when we experience confusion, it's because certainty has been taken away from us or where we feel like our security is in doubt. That's when we experience confusion. So the big idea for today, what I think we can learn from Jesus and what we should try to grow through in confusion is this, is that in confusion, what we crave is certainty. We all know that's not possible. We know that every day we face, there are gonna be uncertain things that happen. But what we can have, what we can forge ahead with is clarity. Now, clarity is different from certainty in this. Clarity is this. Clarity is recognizing all of those things that are outside of our control. Clarity is simply admitting that there is a lot about life that we can't control, and it is grabbing a hold of the things we can Pursuing these things we can control, letting go of that that we can't. To me, that's what clarity is. And I believe that's what we see Jesus. Again, I believe Jesus, most experienced confusion where we see this come to the forefront is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'm gonna look at the account in Matthew chapter 26. We really see um, the torment, the confusion was causing him. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 26. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. In fact, we know that Jesus was so sorrowful. It, we don't see this in Matthew. We actually read it in Luke's account of when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus was so overwhelmed with sorrow. He was experiencing so much doubt that he was literally sweating blood. Have you ever had a, a season in your life where you've been so confused, you've been so overwhelmed that even your sweat is blood? Jesus gets us more than we realize. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, if it's possible, father, may this cup be taken from me. I don't wanna do this. That's what he's saying. I'm not sure I'm ready. I'm not sure I have what it takes. I'm not sure that this is really, the, is this really the plan that you have for me, God? 
Yet not as I will, but as you will. These two sentences may be my favorite two things Jesus ever said in all of his life. Because what's at the heart of it is what I and what I know you experience so much in this life when life's not kind. If anyone, if anyone who's ever walked the face of the earth should have always had certainty, should have been without confusion, it should have been Jesus. Jesus knew, like from the very beginning, like the cross, what he was getting, he was getting ready to be arrested in just a few moments. The cross was happening the next day. If anyone knew what was happening, it was, he knew what was coming and he knew that it had to happen, yet he still struggled with confusion. He still wondered, like, is this really the plan? Do I really have what it takes? I mean, can you just, can you feel the torment that uh, the confusion was causing him in his life? And I would argue that his, his torment didn't start here. It actually goes all the way back to the very beginning of, of his ministry. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, uh, there were two major events that happened that kicked, kicked off his time. It was, it was his baptism in the Jordan River, and then it's when he went into the wilderness immediately following his baptism where he was eventually tempted by Satan. We read in Matthew and Luke that there were three things that Satan tempted Jesus with. I just want to focus on one of them because I believe it was one of these temptations that planted the seeds of doubt that would stick with Jesus that ultimately came out in that prayer that we just read in the garden. This is what we read in Luke chapter 4, verse 5 through 8 about this temptation. It says, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, Jesus, if you just worship, if you just bow down before me, it will all be yours. You can have it all. You can have the throne. Jesus answered. He answered Satan. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What's the temptation that Satan is giving Jesus? Well, let me ask you this question. What was Jesus' ultimate destiny? What was always the plan for Jesus? Jesus' ultimate destiny wasn't the cross and it wasn't the tomb. His ultimate destiny was and is and continues to be the throne. It is to be the throne of all thrones, to be the king of kings and to be the Lord of lords. What is Satan offering Jesus? Satan's offering Jesus the throne. He said, hey, hey, Jesus, this kingdom, this world that we live in, this world that you see, you can be king over all of this. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. Satan was offering Jesus a shortcut. He could have the throne, not the throne of all thrones, but the throne of this world. And the best part of it is that throne didn't require a cross. Satan tempted Jesus with a shortcut. You can get what you want in a much quicker and a much more comfortable manner. That was a temptation. And I believe that temptation planted a seed of doubt that stuck with Jesus throughout his ministry. Now we read, as we read Jesus' response, how we read this little event, because we see Jesus, he immediately replied, you know, he, he quoted scripture, and he says, hey, worship the Lord your God and, and worship him only, right? We read this as a conversation. Like, it didn't affect Jesus. It affected him. It stuck with him. In fact, we not only see it in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see it at another point in Jesus' ministry. In fact, uh, not too long before the Garden of Gethsemane, um, we read an account in Matthew 16. In this, in this account, um, Jesus uh, was with his disciples. He had gone up to the very northern part of Israel, this area known as Caesarea Philippi, and he had gotten away alone with his disciples, and uh, he just started to have this conversation with the disciples, and he basically asked them, he says, who do, who do people say that I am? So the disciples started rattling off some answers, and then Jesus asked them, well, who do, who do, you, who do you think I am? To which Peter the uh, apostle who was always willing to, to step forward first, the willingness to put his foot in his mouth, actually got it right. 
In fact, there was probably no better moment in Peter's life other than like this moment, at least up until this point in his time of following Jesus. Like he, he got it absolutely right. When Jesus says, who do people say I am? You remember what Peter replied? He says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. He nailed it. I, I used to have this professor in college and he was really cheesy like really cheesy. He was one of those guys that um, anytime like you like answered one of his questions really profoundly, or especially like when you did a, a paper, a project, or a test, and you like did really great work, like, like not even just an A plus, but like you exceeded even A plus standards, at least in his mind. In college, he would still pull out a, a gold star and he would put a gold star on, on your paper. That was really cheesy. I shouldn't have liked it, but I did. I loved it, <laughs> that I was like, I exceeded expectations. You know, that's my achiever personality. Peter got a gold star with this answer. He nailed it. Yet even as he nailed it, he didn't, he didn't quite get it. What he meant by you were the Christ, the Messiah, wasn't still the same thing as what Jesus knew to be true as Christ the Messiah. And, and, and so Jesus tries to explain what it means to be the Christ. Listen to these words in, in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 16, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer? That's not the plan for a king. That's not how a king gets to the throne is to, to, to suffer. He, he says uh, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Like, how can you be king if you have to be killed? So Peter, clearly not getting what Jesus was talking about, took him aside and began to rebuke him. He's like, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. This is not the plan. This is not how you get to the throne. There's a much easier way to get to the throne than to have to go through suffering and death. Like, you can't be king if you're dead. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Gold star, F, in a hurry. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Why such the strong response? Doesn't it seem like a really strong response from Jesus? I think the reason Jesus responded so strongly to Peter, calling him Satan, that's not nice. is because that seed of doubt remained. Jesus struggled with confusion throughout his whole life. He gets us. In confusion, when we face times and seasons of life that are confusing, what we want is certainty. Jesus, when he prayed that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he wasn't sure if he had what it took or if the plan was actually going to work. He wanted certainty. How you move forward, though, is through clarity. And what Jesus never lost was clarity. He always had a great grasp on what he could control and what he was supposed to do, and he always did the right thing, even when he didn't fully understand or fully know the outcome. And I believe we can learn some valuable lessons. If you're in one of those seasons where life is off script right now, and you're struggling or you're feeling confusion, what are the things that we can do to move forward with clarity in our own lives? Three things. Here are the three things that we learn from Jesus. You have to anchor yourself in truth. You have to anticipate confusion. Right? And you have to learn to pray through rather than praying away.
Let's jump, let's jump into the first one of those, is, is, is we have to anchor ourselves in truth. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, how did he respond? Where did he find clarity? It was in the word of God. That's where he went back to. He quoted scripture. Uh, in Psalms 119, uh, verse 105, I think about this verse all the time. In fact, it's a verse that I've shared with you before, but it's such a, it's such a great reminder. It just says this. It says, your word, God, your word, it's a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Now, when you think about a lamp, does a lamp give off a lot of light? Most of the time, no, especially back when this was written in 1000 BC, when King David wrote this psalm in 1000 BC, over 3000 years ago, what was their lamp? A lot of times it was just a, a little flask of oil that had a wick in it that was lit. Like that's, that was their lamp. It was basically a small candle. Does that give off much light? Certainly doesn't give off enough light to see like the big picture, right? It's a, to see clearly what's all around you in the midst of darkness. But what it does give enough light off for is it gives enough light for you to see your next step. To just know what you need to do next. The next right thing at the right time. That's what God's word gives us. So I wonder in this season that you may be in in this life, what, what truth from God's word do you need to hang on to? And not just hang on to, but really anchor yourself to. What's an anchor do? An anchor keeps a boat that's in the midst of, 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 of storms, all these giant waves that rocks it back and forth. An anchor keeps a ship in place. It keeps it grounded. What's that truth you, you need? There's, there's, so many, there's so many we could hang on to. Um, let me say this, especially if you're in the midst of trying to make a really tough decision. A truth that you can never go wrong with is, is these words of, of Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39. It just says this. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you're really struggling with a decision or what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to live, you can never go wrong with loving God and loving others or leaning in to receive the love of God and accepting the love of others. That's always a great place to start. We have to anchor ourselves in truth in the midst of a confusing season. The second thing that we have to do is we have to anticipate confusion. We just have to realize that the certainty is not a reality in this life. We are always going to battle confusion. That's again why Jesus was able to respond so well to Peter is because as he continued to struggle with confusion in his own life, he anticipated it. And when Peter tempted him, he was ready to respond in that moment because of that anticipation. The Apostle Paul um, reminds us beautifully in this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that we are going to continue to face complex problems in our life, but they don't have to get the best of us. Listen to these words from Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7 through 9. It says, but we have this treasure. What's the treasure? It's the fact that God is with us, that Jesus is with us. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And not only is he with us, but he gets us. That's the treasure that we get to hold on to every single day, no matter where we go or what we go through in life. We have this treasure in jars of clay. What are the jars of clay? That's me. I'm the jars of clay. I'm fragile. I'm weak. I can't control all the things that I wanna control. And I certainly don't have all the answers that I want to have. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. Perplexed, yeah, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. When we anticipate a lack of certainty, a lack of security in our lives, it helps us keep our eyes 
on the one whom we can depend on, on the one who does have all the power and on the one who does have all the answers. Here's the third thing, is that we have to learn to pray through versus praying away. That's why I love Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He tried to pray it away. He said, God, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He tried to pray it away, but that's not where he ended, is it? Where he ended was, but not my will, your will be done. There's a big difference between praying through and praying away. Well, all of us are really good about, we're all really good about praying it away. Like, God, just, just don't make me go through this. Just, would you just rescue me from this really difficult thing that I'm in? And the reason for that is because the thing we're so consumed with is our comfort. We all, want, we all want to be comfortable, to experience comfortable. The problem, though, with trying to get out of our confusing problems, our really difficult relationships, or those decisions that we just don't know what to do with, is that when we try to get out of them, we don't get anything out of them. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray away. We absolutely should pray away. Jesus did. If he, if he can do it, that certainly gives us permission to do it. But again, that's not, where we, that's not where we should end because praying away is short-sighted. It doesn't have, it doesn't have the larger picture of, of how God is working and what he wants to do in us and through us in mind. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, we just read from that passage. I wanna skip down just a few verses to verses 16 through 18 because I believe this gives us perspective on how to pray through rather than just praying away. These are, these are Paul's words. He says, therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly, we are wasting away. By the way, that's a process we can't stop. I mean, even, even if you think about those moments when Jesus did miracles in his life where he healed people from their disease, where he even raised people from the dead, at some point, those people still died. Like that's the trajectory that we're headed. That's why what Jesus did for us on the cross and being raised from the dead, like that is the source of our hope because we have hope beyond this life. It's as though outwardly or we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That's the perspective. So what do we do? So in order to pray through, we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. God is kind, life always not so much. And when it's not kind, it can put us in this season of just struggling with con confusion, where we doubt, we question, we wonder what God is up to. And as much as we want to, as much as we want it to just go away, even in that moment, we can experience God's kindness there. So as much as we want certainty, as much as we want God just to rescue us, what we must pursue is we've got we've, we've to pursue clarity, what we can control. And we, we, we find that clarity by anchoring ourselves in truth, by anticipating confusion, and ultimately by praying through rather than just praying away. I mentioned at the beginning that uh, three weeks ago, I, I got that call about my brother and his passing away. And uh, it has, um, gosh, it, it's been a great loss for our family. He was an awesome guy. And the really great thing for him is, is he knew the Lord. And so we absolutely know where he is at. And so we have peace. We have peace in the midst of confusion. But I will say, I, I will say this, is, is even though we know where he's at, even though like, all that stuff we could focus on the good, it still doesn't make it easy now.
And to me, that's the power of, of who Jesus is. Because although Jesus can't always take away our temporary pain, we do know that he is with us and that he, that he gets us. And even though things may not be okay, we can be okay. In John 16, uh, verse 33, Jesus says this. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. For those of you who want to believe that God is kind, but you haven't really experienced it maybe ever in your life or at least not recently. If you're in a season of confusion, here's the ironic thing about it, is that there may be no better season where you can get to know the kindness, the goodness, and the care of God than in the season that you're currently in. That's my prayer for you. Father God, as we wrestle through the things of this life that uh, are not what we want, that are off script, and that cause us to question it, cause us to question you, cause us to question ourselves, <laughs> cause us to question all the things around us. God, may we find clarity in who you are, that you are a God who gets us, and that you are a God who's with us. And God, may we find clarity in the promises of who we are in you. God, may we grow to trust you and lean in you and depend on you in these seasons. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.